really laid this sermon on my heart, and we dug it out with the help of his Holy Spirit, and I believe he wants to speak to somebody here today, and I'm simply going to preach that Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. I said Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. So we're going to talk about some things that might be wrong in your life, and then we're going to talk about the solution. His name is Jesus. Amen. Somebody here today needs to surrender once and for all to Jesus Christ. Amen. On this Mother's Day. You see, Jesus is the answer to our broken relationship to God. When God created Adam and Eve, they enjoyed perfect communion. They had perfect fellowship, but Adam sinned. When he disobeyed God, he brought death into the world. Now some people say that this all sounds like mythology. And this is mythical. Well, it's neither mythical or mystical. It's real. Amen? Yes. Amen. It's the truth. You say, well, Pastor, I can't believe this is the truth. Well, that is the whole point of accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. It's a decision that you've got to make. Everybody understand today that whether or not you're a Christian is a decision that you make. Mama can't make you a Christian. Right. Daddy can't make you a Christian. You can't be a Christian because you go to church. You're a Christian when you choose to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So humanity's relationship with God is broken and God provided a covering for Adam and Eve and he promised a Redeemer who would defeat Satan and reconcile God and man. The Old Testament reveals God's plan to save his people. The New Testament shows us that Jesus is the promised Redeemer. Jesus atoned for our sins and he restores the possibility of a relationship with God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus is the answer for our broken relationship with God. Yeah. Apart from him, there is no salvation. I said, apart from him, there is no deliverance. Right. Apart from him, there is no restoration. This is where we lose much of the world when it comes to this fact, when it comes to this truth. Many people say today that there are many ways to God, but there is only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. Acts 4 and verse 12 said, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. First Timothy 2 and 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The biblical term for God's act of making peace with man is called reconciliation. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And then in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, he reminds us that in Christ, God's enemies were made his friends and given life. And he said, if while we were God's enemies, King James says, while we were yet sinners, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled Shall we be saved yes. this through his life? Yes. If you're saved, say amen. amen. If amen. you're saved, say praise the Lord. Praise praise the Lord. This is no small thing we're talking about. We're talking about the new birth. Yes. We're talking about regeneration. We're talking about redemption. Jesus is the answer to the problem of our estrangement from God. <laughs> it is Jesus who makes it possible for our sins to be forgiven. He said in John 1, but as many as received him, to them gave the right to become children of God. To those who believed his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We were talking earlier this morning about adoption. We are all recipients of adoption. Amen. We are all recipients of the adoption by Jesus Christ and the price that was paid. And he is our Savior. It's Jesus who mends our relationship with God so that we can fellowship with Him during our life as well as eventually live with Him forever. And somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I want to tell you, Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Amen. I wanted to lay a foundation and remind you this morning 
about who Jesus is and what this is all about. And why we're here to worship Him and why we're here. But the Lord has really stirred me this week about somebody or someone or people or individuals, plural, who are struggling and you need to be reminded today that Jesus is the answer. Yes. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Amen. So I want to spend some time this morning talking about what's wrong in your life. See, there's one thing, one thing that, that I've learned in, in, in counseling and psychology and courses that I've taken, and I'm nowhere near a counselor, I'm not a professional, but you have to deal with people where they are. You go into an emergency room as a chaplain. You go to the law enforcement as a chaplain. You go as a community chaplain or as a pastor. And somebody says, I'm having a nervous breakdown. You have to start right there. Now, the truth is, they might not be having a nervous breakdown. Fact is, if you'll study the, the term nervous breakdown, it's not even a psychological term. Technically, doctors say that there is no such thing as a nervous breakdown. If you've ever had any degree of a nervous breakdown, you understand that it's very real. And so you have to understand, wherever you meet people, you have to start right there. You have, and sometimes they're not having a problem. They don't, they don't have anything wrong, but they've got a perceived problem. From where they sit, from where they stand, this is going on. So you have to start right there. But Jesus is right for whatever's wrong yes. in your life today. You're sitting here and you say, Pastor, I got, I got some things wrong with my life. Oh, really? I'm not here to make fun. I'm not here to be condescending. But I would like to spend a few minutes trying to help you come to terms with what's wrong in our life. Because I'm going to tell you, most of us don't have any problems. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I didn't have to walk two miles to get a bucket of water this morning. Right. Amen. 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 I saw, I posted on Facebook a picture of a man digging a ditch and he had no arms. And I posted that on Facebook. We don't want to hear anybody complaining about digging a ditch. <laughs> he took that shovel, he put it under his chin, and he was digging a ditch. I'm telling you, just as very as you please, he was getting it done. I'm here to remind everybody that God has blessed us. God is good. And a lot of what we think is wrong in our life is a perceived distortion. It is a distorted reality. And many times the enemy wants us to get up in the morning thinking about what's wrong. I, 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 I try my best to teach and to preach and declare and influence and try to try to and manipulate if I have to. I want you to get up every morning saying what's right All about right. your life. Amen. What's good about your life. Amen. I'm talking about a positive attitude about life. We're blessed. But yet there might be some things wrong. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong. So let's talk about what's wrong. What's wrong in your life, we're going to divide it into five divisions in this teaching this morning, might be under the heading of sadness. Let's talk about sadness. Maybe you're sad. Well, I want to talk some about sadness because I think we misunderstand sometimes. And the simple fact that sadness is a common emotion. Sadness, you know, you may feel sad for different reasons. One of the things I've learned is that it's okay to feel sad. Maybe it's been a while since you've seen your kids. Maybe you're here as a mother. And on Mother's Day, you don't have your children. Maybe you're here and your mother's not here. Maybe this is the first Mother's Day without your mother. It's understandable that you're sad. This emotion that comes in our life. Sadness may cause you to feel emotionally numb or lacking energy. You may cry more often than you normally do. You may have trouble sleeping. Sadness will interrupt your sleep. Uh, or cause you to sleep too much sometimes. Sadness, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching a very practical sermon this morning because I believe that it is needed. We need to be practical and we need to be realistic when it comes to what's wrong in our lives. Somebody's going to leave here today understanding that I thought something was wrong in my life and actually, there's nothing wrong. All right. Sadness 
can affect your appetite. It, it causes you to lose interest. And, and we, we need to respond to sadness. I thought of sadness. Terry, come here just a minute. Uh, I thought of sadness, and Terry's, Terry's name is now sadness. <laughs> and he, isn't he a sad looking guy? <laughs> Sadness, when you get sad, you have circumstances that make you make you sad. Sadness wants to go everywhere you go. Okay. He wants to tag along. He wants to stay just as close. In fact, is he wants to trip you. No, don't, don't do that. <laughs> he wants to trip you. He wants to affect you in any way that he can to slow you down and to trip you up. There comes a time where you have to tell sadness to stay home. See, when sadness gets in the car with you, he always wants to drive. Yeah. Anybody ever met somebody that they didn't want to ride, they had to drive? Yeah. We'll preach this later. It's called <laughs> control. <laughs> Some people, they, they got to drive. We won't, even, we won't even go there. That's the way sadness is. Always want to drive. Well, I want to tell somebody today, make him sit in the back seat. Amen. It's time for you to put distance between right. you and sadness. I'm sorry that you lost what you did. I'm sorry about the marriage that didn't work. I'm sorry about the money you lost. I'm sorry about the death. I'm sorry about the sickness. I'm sorry about the misunderstanding. I'm sorry about the preacher. I'm sorry about the church now. I'm sorry. Whatever it is when you were hurt. Whatever it is that makes you sad. Put some distance I between did. you and sadness. I It's time for you to be in control. And, and Jesus will help you do that. Yes, he will. What I have learned is he's not going to do it in your place. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we forget. We expect so much from God that sometimes we have that, that what's that word, that uh, uh, attitude, that you owe me attitude that we hear about now. Entitled. We have this entitled attitude. God, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to have faith and you're going to do it all for me. Let me know how that works. Because the Bible says that faith with that works is dead. And you can sit and I'm telling you, you've got to take control of the sadness in your life. Whose emotion is it? Does it belong to your pastor? Does it belong to your family member? No, it's yours. Everybody say it's mine. It's mine. You've got to take responsibility for it. It's just like lust. The Bible says when a man is drawn away from his what? His own lust. Well, when you're drawn away from your own sadness. Pastor, I, 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 I'm sad and I've got every right to be sad. Well, you are. But there comes a day where you've got to quit letting him drive the car. Amen. Yeah, exactly. And I want to tell you, Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. And Jesus has delivered you from a constant 24-7 sadness. Somebody amen. say amen. Yeah. Amen. And so we need to be aware, and I've got a lot more information, but I want to go on. Let's, let's talk about what might be wrong in your life. And I want to go beyond sadness. And I, I'm not trying to get beyond sadness. But when I meet sad people, sometimes I just want to shake them. Sometimes, sometimes you know, they ever ask me, hey, how are you doing? And then they tell you how bad it is. Well, I'm concerned about people, and I'm concerned about people going through loss, and I don't take that for granted, and I'm not here to be condescending or uh, in any way cold. But I want to tell you that there comes a time where you need to leave sadness at home, and you need to have the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. You need to embrace God's joy. I want to say to somebody this morning, enough already. Enough already. Second thing I want to talk about might be wrong in your life is under the title of selfishness. What might be wrong in your life that Jesus can take care of is selfishness. We hear a lot today about narcissists. When I was when I was growing up, even as a young adult, I, I didn't I never heard the word narcissist, and now we hear it a lot. <coughs> And, and so the question might be, how can I not be a selfish person? I want to tell you, there's very little you can do about somebody else being selfish. 
Don't raise your hand, but how many of you ever tried to fix somebody that was selfish? Fix somebody that was self-centered. Well, I'm going to tell you, they're self-centered because of what's been done to them. In their life, in their childhood, they've been neglected, they've been abused. There's, let me say it like this, there's a reason they're self-centered. And we want God to help them. And Jesus is right for whatever's wrong yes, in their life. Yes. And so we want to focus on what can I do to be less self-centered. And I'm just going to share a few things. One thing you can do is focus on listening instead of talking. Amen. Selfish people always want the floor. Mm -hmm. You can put yourself in someone else's shoes. In other words, to be empathetic. And be sympathetic. We can use less I statements and me statements. I want to tell somebody with all the love that's within me. When it comes to relationships, it's not all about you. Right. Amen. 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 And so we need to examine, Lord, what can I do to be a less self-centered person? What can I do? Well, one thing we can do is learn how to compromise. Mm -hmm. Me in the middle. Boy, it is quiet in here. <laughs> <laughs> learn to share the spotlight. Let somebody else be in charge. Be a good follower. Amen? Amen. Amen. Be a good follower. You'll never be a good leader if you're not a good follower. Leadership doesn't come with a title, it doesn't come with a promotion, it doesn't come with a salary. It comes because you learn about leadership by being a good father. Mm -hmm. And so whatever's wrong in your life might be because of selfishness. Some pastors are selfish. They think it's all about them. They talk about my church and my ministry and my people. If I remember right, Jesus said that it's his church. Amen. And Jesus said, if my people, God said, if my people who are called by my name. See, this is not about some church folk are selfish. And they think it's all about them. They think the, the, the ministry and the church is all about them. But I'll tell you, Jesus is right for whatever's wrong. Yeah, yeah, and if what is wrong has to do with selfishness, then let's get all the glory to Him. Now, I have a lot I could put in here today that, that is very spiritual in nature, but God kept pushing me to be practical. The truth is, we all know how to pray. The truth is, we all know how to fast. But you can pray and fast and still blow it. See? By just not applying something that is practical and something that will help you, like not using the I statement all the time. Making an effort by not having to have the spotlight all the time. So there's sadness and there's selfishness. And then the next group I put under the term sickness. You might be sick today. Well, I've got good news. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong yes. in your life yes. and in your body. Yes. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your body. And I want to take those first three points and put them together and then tell you that sometimes we're so focused on the sickness that we can't see the selfishness. Amen. Sometimes we're so focused on the pain and the sickness that we can't see the sadness. But Jesus is right for healing. Jesus is right to touch your body. Yes. I believe that we need to understand and, and look at the word that says in Matthew 8, 16. He tells us when evening had come that they brought to him many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word. And he healed all who were sick. Now he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe. We believe in healing. We believe in divine healing. Yes. There's a lot of other scriptures, but I, I believe everybody here understands that Jesus was a healer. We talk about it. We in the church of God, we're not we're not strangers. We we have prayer lines. We lay hands on the sick, and 
We believe God for healing. Yes. I believe the problem, the problem. Everybody say the problem. The, the problem. problem. the problem in not receiving our healing for our sickness is that many times we're ignoring our selfishness. Or we're ignoring other problems in our lives. And we're letting them stay. But we're wanting God to take away the sickness. Mm -hmm. Now listen, you just heard the best preaching you're going to hear. That's not easy preaching. Right. Brother Phil. But I'm going to tell you, that's the truth. Amen. We got folks We got folks that want to have a bad attitude, but want to have a healing. Amen. <laughs> they, want to, they want to live their way. They want it all to be about them if they want to get their healing. And then they don't know why they're not getting their healing. Well, you and I need to understand that Jesus is right for whatever is wrong. He's got a way that will work. He said, I am the way. If it's not working, then let's look at the way. Let's look at the process. The Word of God says that there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. In other words, that way is not working. Jesus is an healer. And in our communication with Him, and in our relationship with Him, and in our dynamic with Him, He's not the wrong one. He hasn't changed. He hasn't backed away. He's not going to back away. He loves you and He loves me. But if you want healing in your life, understand that He's right for whatever is wrong. We just got to get it right. Yes, amen. I know that it rains on the just and the unjust, but I can't get up here and tell you that it's God's will for you to be sick. I cannot, I cannot get up here and preach that. When I study the Word of God and I study divine healing and I study divine health, I find too many scriptures, I find too much truth that teaches us that it is God's plan for you and I to walk in hell. Yes, for us to walk. Some things we're sick because we're eating wrong. Yes. Right? yes. You know, I want to tell somebody, including your pastor, sometimes we're sick and God ain't got nothing to do with it. <coughs> Listen, sometimes we're sick and the devil ain't got nothing to do with it. Come on. Right. And the devil's been on. I've been studying this week. Some of the best teaching I've ever heard from Terry Stone. I got it this week in the mail, and I could not, I could not get it open fast enough to listen to it. He, he got a, a new CD put out on several things that he's learned about about spiritual warfare. And I'm telling you, everything's not spiritual warfare. You go out not dressed properly, and you get cold, and you're sick. That's not spiritual warfare. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm gonna make y'all stay a little later. If y'all don't start, if y'all don't start amen and me. You go to the car lot and buy a car that you can't afford. Come on. And then you get to pray and cry because you can't make the payment. That's not spiritual Come warfare. On. Come on. The devil didn't do that. God didn't do that. You did that. Preach it. Amen. 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 You talk and act like the devil, and then you want, no, it's not the devil's fault. It's our fault. It's our responsibility. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong. Let him teach us how to act. Let him teach us how to speak. Let him teach us how to think. Let him teach us how to behave. Amen. Amen. Matthew 21, 14, then the vine and the lamb came to him in the temple and he healed him. People say, well, I don't believe God's doing those miracles today. Well, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's doing it where people will get alignment. And it's not first and foremost a corporate alignment. It is a personal alignment. In other words, you're not going to be where you need to receive healing. Just because you hang around somebody that's in the line. That's right, amen. You can hang on somebody's coattail. I'm telling you, we got some praying people in this church. Amen. You can you can hang on somebody's coattail, but until you get it right, right. you're not going to receive the healing that you need. Right. See, Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life, but see, there's no variation with him. There's no variables with him. It's going to be his way. Oh, you're not going to get the healing. So 
It might be sadness. It might be selfishness. It might be sickness. And the point is, is that it might be sinfulness. That's right. Now we have to look at this and understand that Jesus is right for whatever's wrong. And nobody wants the preacher to talk about sin anymore. Come on. But sin is the problem. Yes. That's right. God forbid that we ever get so big and so, uh, so whatever progressive as a church that we quit preaching the truth. Amen. And the truth is that the wages of sin is death. Yeah. But the gift of God is eternal life. Proverbs 14 and 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people Amen. or all people. Nobody's exempt. We have a problem. There's a universal problem that we have, and it's not COVID, it's sin. Amen. <clears throat> no matter what subject you look at, we live in a day of compromise. We live in a day where people are trying to get a new and a fresh understanding and trying to explain away sin. He didn't mean this, he didn't mean that. D denominations are splitting, and churches are splitting, and families are splitting because somebody is forsaking the Word of God. Now, what God teaches about homosexuality has never changed. It is not God's plan for man and man and for woman and woman. No policy, no politics, no popularity, nothing is going to change that thing. I've studied a lot, read a lot about sociology and if I had my life to live over again, I, I probably would have pursued a degree in sociology. I'm fascinated. But when you look at sociology and you look at biology, there's a, there's a connection. You know what happens? As societies change and as societies, as societies uh, compromise, what happens is changes take place within the bodies. But it doesn't change the Word of God. Right. Amen. We live in a day, our children, our teenagers, our college students are taught that when it comes to gender, when it comes to sexual orientation, that it, and they're taught not only in high school, they're taught much earlier now, that sexual orientation is something that you, it can go either way. You can be homosexual, you can be heterosexual, you can be bisexual, or you can be asexual. Those four are literally listed in the teaching. Asexual means that you're not attracted to any, uh, and you know the rest. And so what happens is we're raising a generation that begin to accept and believe that everything's all right. Well, guess what? Their parents start listening to their kids, and now the parents are being influenced by the kids and the grandparents. And instead of children being influenced by godly parents, ungodly parents are being influenced by, by children. Yes. We've got statistically somebody sitting here today, and you're disagreeing with me. And it's okay, I understand, but I'm going to stand here for the truth. Amen. Yes, sir. Nothing, nothing is going to change the law of God. Amen. Nothing is going to change the law of God. Sin is a problem. You say, well, I'm attracted to the same sex. Well, I understand that that can be confusing. I understand that that might be frustrating. But I will tell you this, that doesn't change the truth. Right. And I'll tell you this, you can get deliverance from that. Yes. You can be delivered from that. Yes. And if we'll teach our children about deliverance and teach them about Jesus being the answer and Jesus being right for whatever's wrong, then when they feel that for the first time or they encounter that for the first time, then they will come to you and they will go to Jesus and they will pray. And I'm telling you that God will deliver them. Yes. Yes. Amen. 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 Unpopular teaching. They do. You'll get labeled a heretic. You'll get labeled a bigot. You'll get labeled a, a, a lot of other things by preaching this. Mm -hmm. But you see, sin is the problem. Right. Amen. When you commit adultery, you're destroying your marriage. Amen. When you commit adultery, you're destroying your relationship. The wages of sin is death. Men shall reap what he sows. When you sow those seeds of sin, so well, Pastor, what do I do? Well, the first thing you do is you repent. Yes. Amen. Well, I repented last night. Well, repent again. Yes. And then let's stick to it. Amen. Tomorrow, God says He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And and as you go through life, if there are issues and there are pressures, sooner or later you've got to stand up against sin. Yes. Sooner or later you've got to stand up and live right. 
Sooner or later, you've got to stand up and walk from it. Well, I can't help it, though. You can help it. You just have to help it. It comes down to the point. Do, am I going to walk in sin or am I going to, or am I going to walk in righteousness? It's that simple. Right. Right. The problem is sin. Sin is breaking a transgression against the law of God. Anything that we do that goes against the word of God is sin. Everybody wants a list of sins. Everybody wants a denominational document, a positional paper, something to tell them what to do and not to do. I've got a better idea. And that is just walk in the spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Because I'm going to tell you, you can go by every rule of the Church of God and still split hell right over there. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. It's, not about, it's not about penance. It's not about... The, the, all of those things, if it's done right, can help. Don't, don't leave here telling somebody that I was preaching heresy this morning. I believe we need good doctrine. I believe we need... Uh, uh, we believe in sound doctrine. Right. But I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit will show you what yes, it is. Yes. The Holy Spirit will lead. It's called the law of the Spirit. Yes. On the tables of your heart. Amen. And if you will be sensitive to Him, then He will lead you. And the problem of sin will become less and less of a problem. Now, I don't believe we're going to be without that challenge and without that problem until we get to heaven. The Bible says that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe everybody in this room, no matter how sanctified you are, and I don't say that sarcastically, I tell you no matter where you are, everybody in here can sin today. Yes. Amen. We, everybody here, can have doubt in your heart or talk about somebody. I've heard the story about a precious grandmother that they couldn't get her to say anything bad about anybody. And one of the grandchildren, a friend of mine, she, she went to her and she said, Granny, so-and-so across the hill, I might have told this, but I'm going to tell you. A so-and-so across the hill over here, she began to tell her, said, he is a bad man, he this and he that, and don't you know, don't you know? And she tried her best to get her granny to say something bad about that man. She talked to her, talked to her, and finally granny spoke up. You know what she said? She said, I, I heard he's a good whisperer. <laughs> in other words if you can't say something good don't say anything see there's all kinds of, of sin and all degrees of sin you say well pastor man, you just know how we got to be conscious every day of everything we do <laughs> is this an aha moment <laughs> The light comes on. You're exactly right. We're to be diligent. The Bible says walk in the spirit that we might not fulfill the lusts of the, or the desires of the flesh. So if sin is the problem, then Jesus is the answer. Yes. The problem. Let me just remind you: sin wrecks and ruins. Yes, sin wrecks and ruins. Yes. Sin torments and binds. I said sin torments and binds. It'll put you in a bind. It'll get you stuck. Yes. Anybody ever drive a vehicle and all of a sudden you felt the ground get soft and it? Now I'm going to tell you, if it's real soft and you're pulled on it, it's probably too late. <laughs> when the ground gets soft, get out of there. Amen? Amen. The Bible says don't, don't give place to the devil. That's right. If there's a street downtown that gives you trouble, don't get on that street. My dad used to tell a story about a man, every time he'd go by a bar, he'd, run, he'd see him run across the street and drink a gallon of milk. <laughs> <laughs> he said if he filled his belly with milk, he didn't have room for what he really wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Sin is a problem. And Jesus is right for what I was wrong yes. about. The last one I want to talk about comes under the heading of satisfaction. Some people are just too satisfied. Yes. The Bible said in 1 Peter 2 and 2 is newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. That you may grow thereby. Psalm 81 said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Amen. Deuteronomy 8 3, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, 
which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. I love Isaiah when he said in 55 and 1, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And you who have no money, somebody say, Praise the Lord. In a day of inflation, you don't have to have money. You just got to have a hunger for God. We got folks that are so satisfied, they're not hungry. They're just satisfied riding this thing out. Everything's going good. Got money in the bank. Get a check every month. Get a check every week. Got this figured out and this figured out. Church is good. This is good. And you're just not hungry. You're satisfied. You might be the one with the biggest problem. If you're here today and you're satisfied, then I want to tell you, Jesus is right. Whatever's wrong in your life.